What do we know about those three friction forces? All three of them. Not necessarily equal. All three of them are at their maximum. One will become it to the maximum first, and then as you increase F, that one will stay at the maximum, and then the others will start to increase to their maximums. So if we, uh, we'll keep it simple. We'll use a coefficient of friction that's the same for uh, all three surfaces. We have uh, also that surface there. We'll just use the same coefficient of friction in all three surfaces just to keep things a little bit simpler with all, all of our notations, uh, uh, everything else we're trying to figure. So we know that then each of these will be at their respective maximums. Which is that coefficient of friction times it, it's uh, times the normal force holding those two surfaces together. That helps. It reduces the number of unknowns. How many are there? How many unknowns are there? So we can begin to gather the right number of <coughs> equations. How many unknowns? I have a vote for three. What three did you see, Alan? <coughs> All right, certainly Q, N, and P are unknown. F is unknown because we're looking for that. We're looking for the force required to just start to lift the load. So we can consider that an unknown too. We won't consider the loads to be unknown because presumably if you're, um, it's your task to raise this load, you can go figure out how big it is before you get started. So we have four unknowns. Um, F, P, Q, up. And they're not always listed alphabetically. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. We have that kind of flexibility. So we got those unknowns. We need four equations. Can we come up with four? Oh, by the way, uh, we'll assume that the angle is known. The angle of the wedge. We'll call that alpha. So what four equations do we have? Alpha P, W L D, W L plus. No, no, in general, what four equations? So we don't have necessarily one equation for each each uh, unknown. Well, for some of the moments, we're going to need some of the dimensions. Remember, we're going to need the moment arms to do these. So the some of the moments we could use, but we need a lot more information. Maybe we don't need them. In fact, we don't. But what are the four equations? Okay, there's two. Some of the forces in the X, some of the forces in the Y. We won't consider these uh, uh, equations that we can use because we'll just use these equations to change the friction into the normal forces and eliminate the friction values themselves as unknowns, which is why we don't have those listed there. They're already replaced. So some of the forces in the x direction, some in the y. We need 
to have equilibrium in both directions. So there's two equations. It's a 2D problem, so our sum of the forces as vectors becomes just those two. Two more equations. Checking on eBay for two spare equations for sale. Maybe there's a buy it now option because you don't want to wait seven days for the option to close. Yeah, we can change the direction, <coughs> but that will not be independent of these. So that won't count as two, uh, 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 two more independent equations. Oh, that's not in your notes. It's up on the board. Trevor, put your sunglasses down. See if that helps. You see them? No. There they are. <laughs> Maybe you need those 3D glasses from the movies. There's two equations. What are the other two? Did it help it when I rephrased it that way? No. Is it just the same for the other object? Exactly. There's two objects. No. <laughs> so we do this. We do this for both the load. It's very fair. Do this for the load and for the wedge. Is that a promise or a threat? Both. Okay, duly accepted. All right. So let's. Now that we've calmed down, let's do that. We'll do that. Uh, it doesn't matter which order, of course. We'll do it for the load. Sum the forces in the x direction. So that's uh, that's q in one direction plus n. Let's see. Uh, that's alpha there. The, the difference between vertical and the normal on the face will always give us alpha. So we want n um, sine alpha against this q and a little bit of the force, uh, the friction force, but we know what that is, also against the q. So we've got then just uh, q equals n sine alpha. That's the little piece of the normal force. And then also opposing that is the friction at that face, and that would be cosine alpha. Does that look right? For, for the load? We've got Q to the right, N sine alpha to the left and F cosine alpha to the left and I took out the F and put in the, uh, the coefficient times the normal. So I think that looks okay. And in the Y direction, again for the load, we've got uh, the, the weight itself down, which we take to be a known. Also, we've got the friction down, so that will add on to the same size. And then we've got uh, some of the normal force up and some of the friction up. The opposite, the trig signs on them. So it would be N cosine alpha up plus mu s N sine alpha on the upside. Look okay? Alright, you guys do the same thing 
for the wedge. So we don't get duplicate gifts. Maybe <laughs> some more some more colors for your chalk. I got plenty of colors for my chalk. Come in and see the my, my stash. On Christmas. <laughs> On Christmas holiday holiday chalk. Uh, 
finally the square bracket closes over that same quantity, 1 minus mu s squared minus 2 mu s tan alpha. Oh, we got to squeeze in a little bit here. We don't need the free body diagram anymore. times WF. So if the weight of the wedge is significant, it can play a factor in here. And of course, the, uh, the coefficient of friction between the surfaces all plays a factor. <coughs> so let's see what that does. If mu s equals zero, how could we do that? Yeah, the, 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 how, what would we have to do for no friction? I mean, we can grease the surfaces. We can use frozen icy grease. We can use that stuff that's under the stove in your kitchen and heat it. And then <laughs> or we could we could use rollers on the surfaces. Massless wedges. Massless everything. Massless everything. So so if uh, let's put in some numbers here. Let's uh, let's assume that the weight of the wedge is. 20% of the weight of the load, just to pick some numbers to, to see what kind of things happen to the applied force we need. And we'll pick a, a wedge angle of 10 degrees, just so we can get some numbers in there, see what kind of different things happen. If we do that, then F is a little over 17% of the load. Which is a lot easier than going in and just trying to lift the load directly. Which is the point of using a wedge. So, not very much. You've got a, a big load to lift. You only need to apply 18% of that same force to be able to lift the load. Uh, any problems with this setup? That's that's as small as we can get. There's no such thing as a negative coefficient, so we can't go any smaller. Any problems with this setup? Huh? Oh, the rollers would be awful darn close. If we get somebody else to pack the bearings, and not you, evidently. <laughs> What would happen if we have this setup? If we, if we use rollers, push the wedge in, raise the load. Yeah, if we've got to keep that force there full time. If we release, if we go for a coffee break, whatever the union rules are, that wedge is going to shoot right out. So we're not going to be able to do that. So we'll go up to mu s of about 0.2 using those other two values. Then we get a, a force, a required force. Anybody want to guess? Just just put a ballpark number to it. I mean, all you have to do is, is put those numbers in here and do this in your head real quick. See what you get. But just, just for a... Come on, Alan, you love to use your intuition on everything, beyond all reason. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so what percentage of the weight do you think we have here? Just to see where you feel. Uh, 35. <laughs> 36. Six. Sixty-eight percent. Yeah, I was like, you're right there. 
and that that point too that's pretty low so you're you're saving some but you're not saving you're gonna worry is about there, is there something intuitive about that that I missed no oh, <laughs> no <laughs> I just wanted to see what you're thinking uh, if we go to point four. Yeah, actually, it goes to uh, 144 <laughs> percent. So you do need to apply more force than you would if you just plain lifted the load. However, it could be that you have a way to easily apply large horizontal forces and not large vertical forces. Because to raise the load, you've got to be under it somehow, or at least hook onto the top of it at the very least. And you might not necessarily be able to do either one of those. So it may be that a wedge is all you've got, even if uh, you do have to pay a force penalty in it, if you want to call it that. It may be the only way you can do it anyway. Yeah, going to affect that too, obviously. Yeah, and the angle, of course, is going to affect that. The greater the angle, the more these are going to go on. In fact, if you, if you, uh, if I remember, if you graph these, um, this would be maybe mu s across here and f something like that. It goes uh, fairly. Actually, it doesn't go through the origin goes through some positive thing there, but then it starts to turn up like that. It's, it seemed very linear. I don't know, I, I don't, there's no reason it should have been linear in there, but it, it appeared to be very much linear uh, when I graphed that equation last night, just for funsies. <laughs> okay. All right, so our next application of these wedges is to take a wedge and wrap it around a cylinder. When you do that, what you get is a screw. So this, this, will, this will test our sketching abilities like nothing we've done before. So a couple light lines there going vertically, because then we have to put the threads in. So we're going to look at square threads rather than um, rather than uh, the m more common triangular th threads, just because that will help us a little bit, uh, help simplify things a little bit. So there's, there's one thread that wraps around to the back, so it looks something like that. And then the next thread will be down a little bit, of course. And our beautiful technical freehand sketch takes shape, of which we're immensely proud.
And then, of course, we also need to look at uh, the angle. That's perfectly analogous to the angle of a wedge. If you take uh, a triangular piece of paper and wrap it around a pencil, what you're <coughs> going to make for yourself is essentially a screw. So a, a, a wedge is an unwound screw, if you will. And then, of course, that all rides in some mating surface that goes, uh, of course, all the way around the screw. And it's the friction between the threads and that mating surface uh, and the lateral forces that uh, concern ourselves. Because it's the lateral forces that raise the um, raise or lower the screw or keep it in place if that's a concern and um, it's the uh, lateral forces that do the raising and lowering. So we'll put in here some kind of moment that will apply to the screw. That may be the moment we need to apply to actually get the screw to move due to the friction in the threads, or it may be a moment we need to apply just to hold the screw in its place because the force might be enough or the friction might be low enough that that force will spontaneously move the screw on its own. So we may need to do something to hold it in its place. So that's the, the setup we've got there for this picture. We'll look at a, a little elemental piece of the thread. Bring it over here and blow it up so that we can look at it then. Okay, it's got an angle alpha on it. And there's some friction and some normal force. There. And if you remember, as we've done before, we don't always do, but we can do it this time. Let me put it in a different color. There's a resultant of those two. And if we're right at the point of impending motion, then this angle is the angle of static friction. And if you remember, um, that's equal to our coefficient of static friction. So if we're right at the point of impending motion, we know what that angle is, and that angle there is alpha, the angle between the normal and the vertical. So we're at, we're at a point where we're just trying to move the thing, and we've got most of the pieces there. <coughs> this is uh, a differential element, so that's just length dl. Now, there's no other forces on this element. The 
because it's in contact with the bottom of the threads, but not at the top. You never have threads that are so tightly fit that there's friction at both places, or you normally would want to do that. So this, the thread is riding on the bottom of its contact surface, but there's space at the top, so we don't need uh, force on both sides. So um, the total force we're trying to lift must equal the sum of all of the other vertical forces in the opposite direction, which is, oh sorry, this is an R, really, this is, since it's a differential element, this should be, I guess, dn, df, and dr, a little elemental piece, and then it's all the way around all of the threads that give us this total load that we're trying to lift. So the vertical component is dr cosine the two angles. So cosine phi s plus alpha dr. That's the elemental part of the vertical force. But we need all of those all the way, all the way around. So we'll integrate over the entire length of the thread. And this is a constant, so it comes out. So we just have to integrate over the entire length of the thread, um, which we don't even have to bother with because we're going to be done with that in, uh, in just a second here. The moment we need to exert to actually turn this is the uh, part of this force that is at some moment arm which is the mean radius of the threads. Not, <coughs> it's the average between the uh, radius of the shaft and the radius of the farthest out, outer edge of the threads themselves, the mean radius. drawing, but if you let this elemental piece move to the side, then what we're concerned with is not the vertical part that's opposing the F, we're interested in the horizontal part of this that's acting at some distance R. So that'll be R, the moment arm, times the size of the force that is acting at that moment arm, which is that. So this is uh, that R is the moment arm, and the rest of it is the force acting at that moment arm. And then we again total all those up. This comes out because it's all constant, and we have the, the same basic type of idea we had in the one before. Yep. So R is from like the center of the screw to it's the not, little R? Yeah, it's yeah. not like the circumference radius thing or the No, the it's it's that? the mean radius between the radius of the shaft of the screw and the radius of the outer extent of the screws themselves. We just use the mean radius. There's not a huge difference between those two. So it's not a big deal to use these. Um, in that way. So we've got now all of the pieces. I think we're okay. And so this, uh, we can combine these 
and there's a little bit of algebra that's in there, of course, but not a whole lot. And we get down to where we have the moment directly related to the force, which we've got here. And then we can put that in by making this then the tangent of that same angle. Make sure I got it right. Um, so that's the moment we need to exert to just get these thread, threads to move to start lifting the force. We know that because we're at the, uh, at the static limit. To, for, uh, for moving at constant rate, If we turn the screws enough just to get them to move, then we're also interested in what do we have to do once they're moving to get it to raise the load at a constant rate. Uh, it's exactly the same analysis, only we have the kinetic angle instead of the static angle. That's just to move the screw. We need to get to the static limit. Then once we've gotten beyond that, we can then uh, use a, a slightly lower moment just to keep the screw moving at a constant rate. Um, where's the easiest place to put this in? Let's see. I think we're done with this. It's beautiful. It breaks my heart to have to erase it. Oh well. You get to keep your drawing. Mine are ephemeral. Who's going to Google that for the class? Nobody? You know what it means? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, to lower the load, we have the same, same things. Let's see. Combine to get the to to just start to raise the load. And this is to raise at a constant rate. If we want to lower the load, if we want to do the screws the other way, start to bring it down, all that happens is this sign turns to a minus sign. So I'll put that in another color. M R F tan minus alpha to lower lower. If we S, if we're just ready to start to lower the load, if we K if we're actually lowering the load at a constant rate. Okay, so we'll do a, a quick problem if we can squeeze it in. So here's a beam, and over here we have a collar. Below that we have a A thing we can screw, uh, we can turn, and that whole thing rides on a threaded shaft. So if we turn the uh, turn buckle or whatever you might want to call it, we can raise and lower the beam, and we'll uh, conveniently put something on there that we need to do that with. Hundred and eighty kilograms and 
a half meter on either side of the beam. Okay, got the picture. We're going to spin this thing here. It's got little handles on it to help us get some more moment by giving us a little bit more moment arm. We can turn this and in that way raise or lower the, uh, the load. Alan, you okay with that? Yeah. You got one of those in your house? Yeah? No, because they don't actually work it unless the side on the right was free to move as well. What? This? Yeah, that would have to be able to... Oh, that just slides. Yeah, but if you tried to do that, they wouldn't go anywhere. If the if the pole was rigid, it's, it's a non-rigid pole. <laughs> it's made out of cooked spaghetti. <laughs> Alan, you don't shop at the right place. I mean, you shop where I shop. All right. So some of the details in here, uh, meaning the coefficient of friction between the surfaces, the the, the threads. And the radius, radius is 40 millimeters. The static coefficient is 0.25. Kinetic coefficient, we'll use 0.2. And a thread pitch of 5 millimeters. to raise that load. So maybe we can leave these two equations. One to just get the load to start moving and one to actually move it at a constant rate. So we don't need to do both, they're both pretty much the same. Um, so we can we can do one at a time. All right, a couple things we need first. We've got the, the basics of the screw here, but we also need alpha. To get alpha, if it's a single screw, it's just the pitch divided by 2 pi r, where r is that mean radius of the threads. So that's easy to come up with. That puts alpha at 1.6. <coughs> One four degrees. Uh, the other thing we need is uh, just what is the force that we're trying to lift. What's the force on this point? But it hopefully is obvious to you that it's one half of the load because the load is twice as far away from the left end. So the force at the right end is going to be uh, half of the load. So that gives us an F of 88, 88.3, I think. Yep. That's one half the weight of the load. 883 newtons. And then it's a matter of just putting it in the equation to uh, see what we get for the moment. And we'll, we'll just do this one to raise it at a constant rate, yeah, because we're getting almost out of time there. So we just have to put in R. .04 meters, if we want the answer in Newton meters. The uh, F is 883 and then times the tangent of 3k remember that that equals the, the tangent of that equals the coefficient of friction so that angle is 12.41 degrees so we have the tangent of 
1.41 degrees plus 1.14 degrees. And that gives us a moment then of 8.51 newton, uh, newton meters. Which isn't very much to, to raise a, a fairly substantial load. Then to check to make sure once we release that moment that we're applying there, once we release that, will it stay in its place? All we have to check is uh, is the angle alpha less than the static angle. If it is, then there's no amount of force you could put on there that would cause that, uh, that to unscrew. And since this is a pretty shallow angle, 1.14 degrees, it's very unlikely. And in fact, you check that and it doesn't. This, this comes out to be 14 degrees, something like that. Yeah, a little over 14 degrees. So the answer is then, yes, it will stay. And that's a wrap.